Hello, everybody. Um, my name is William Friedman. Uh, thanks for uh, for joining us on uh, the, this panel, where we're going to look at the ripple effect, how and why the SEC targeted one specific cryptocurrency. Uh, joining me on uh, the news reporter side is Nicholas Day, a business reporter at CoinDesk with a focus on regulators, lawmakers, and institutions. His work has been featured in The Nation and referenced by the Washington Post, ZDNet, Gizmodo, uh, New Jersey Advanced Media, and the Philadelphia Inquirer. He owns less than $20 in Bitcoin Core and has no other crypto holdings. Joseph Hall Esquire uh, on the newsmaker side is a partner with the Davis Polk and Wardwell uh, firm's uh, corporate department and co-head of the firm's ESG, that's Environmental, Social, and Corporate Governance, as we know from previous uh, 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 panels uh, group. Um, his advisory practice includes working with blockchain and crypto asset companies and sponsors on federal securities law matters. Between 2003 and 2005, he served at the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, ultimately as managing executive for policy under Chairman William H. Donaldson, where he assisted in directing the commission's policy making and enforcement activities. Um, I am here to remind you that this is in a webinar format. Uh, you'll all be muted until uh, called on Q&A, and uh, we hope to have at least 10 minutes to 15 minutes of, um, of Q&A. And uh, Britt, if it's okay with you, maybe we'll break up the discussion and we'll talk for about 20, 25 minutes and have a Q&A session, then uh, go back to, uh, to the panel and then wrap up again with another Q&A. So, um, gentlemen, let, let's start. Uh, actually, I, I want to start with, with you, Nick. Um, uh, as, a, as a journalist, um, what do you find uh, most challenging and most rewarding about covering uh, crypto and, and within their uh, crypto coverage and covering uh, regulatory affairs around crypto? Yeah, so. Um... Thanks for having me, first off. It's uh, great to be here. Um, Crypto is a very interesting space to be covering right now. Um, you know, it, I started in 2017 just as the last bull run was beginning, but over the past three years, it's really kind of matured a lot, I think, in ways, you know, people weren't necessarily sure would happen, uh, you know, before then. So it is, it is really interesting just seeing how this technology is actually being adopted and used. And also, you know, on the counter side, how, you know, what the limitations still are and, you know, how people are trying to approach these limitations or if they're approaching them at all. So it, it is just very fascinating just kind of watching it. And then the regulatory front is really interesting to me in particular. I just really enjoy seeing how this kind of, you know, this brand new technology that's designed with this idea of being stateless and being, you know, uh, independent of centralized entities. Uh, it, it's really fun just kind of watching how it comes up against, you know, this existing, um, you know, regulatory financial infrastructure that, uh, you know, the world's built up over years and decades. So, um, you know, just kind of seeing how these two worlds collide and then where they have similarities and where they have differences, that's been really kind of fun to watch. And, you know, I'm just kind of here to map out the ride as it continues. Awesome. So, uh, Joe, it, it seems to me that uh, this is really an exciting place and time to, to be as an attorney of uh, handling uh, regulatory affairs uh, and being involved in cryptocurrency, because there doesn't seem to be a, a whole lot of, uh, of trails blazed here. Um, do you find yourself uh, in a position to make new law or to participate in crafting, and uh, what what does it mean to you? What 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 made you gravitate towards uh, this particular niche? Um, I I uh, yeah I, I kind of follow my clients. Um, <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not a technologist. I'm a um, a simple country capital markets lawyer. Um, <laughs> um, but um, you know, in the past, you see the Caymans, huh? <laughs> Yeah, in the, in the past, um, I, I, 
the, the first uh, client I had in this space, um, I think I started working for in probably, I don't know, 2013, 2014. And uh, it, 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 uh, uh, you know, it, it was bef- it was before the ICO boom of sort of the 2017, 2018 timeframe. And uh, it was sort of like a law school exam every single day. I mean, the issues were, you know, all issues of first impression. I mean, I think I've been practicing securities laws for, um, you know, close to uh, 20, 25 years at that point. Um, and had never really had to grapple with the question of, you know, is this thing a security or not? Um, and, and that's sort of, um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty big part of my practice today. Um, you know, trying to, trying to figure out, you know, whether something is a security and therefore subject to regulation by the SEC or whether it's outside and, um, uh, and, and then, you know, trying to explain that to, uh, you know, to, to clients who, um, you know, have a, have a very hard time, frankly, understanding why, you know, the activities that they're doing, um, are going to be regulated by the SEC and, uh, you know, everybody can point to an asset somewhere else and say, well, how come, how come they can do what, what, uh, what they're doing? And you're telling me that we can't, that I can't do what, uh, what we want to do. And, and oftentimes my response has to be to them is, well, I'm not so sure that what you're pointing to is actually legal. And, you know, the XRP case was a pretty major demonstration of that. And funny you should mention that you got into this in 2013, because that's about the same time that uh, that uh, Brad uh, that that, uh, that Brad oh, yeah. Johnson and Chris Larson got into it. Uh, they yeah. the the uh, uh, the founders and chief executives of, um, of of Ripple Labs, which is uh, uh, XRP adjacent, and. You know, and, and actually the, the whole lawsuit filed by the SEC involves actions that were taken in 2013. Why did they file them, what was it, at the, at the beginning of 2021, the end of 2020? I, I, think, that's, I think that's a great question. I mean, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think it's lost on anybody that it was filed on uh, former Chairman Clayton's uh, last full day in the office. Um, and of course, you know, the SEC is a, um, uh, you know, has, it acts by majority vote. Um, there were five people on the commission and to authorize a lawsuit, um, you need to have a majority of the commission, which um, if there are only four commissioners, which there were going to be the very next day and still are today until uh, incoming chairman Gensler is, is confirmed. Um, you know, you would have had to have three commissioners authorize that lawsuit. Um, and so the fact that it was authorized on, you know, it was effectively Chairman Clayton's last day in the office, you know, at least raises the question of whether there would have been three commissioners willing to vote on that lawsuit the very next day. Um, so, you know, I, I, we, we don't know at this point, you know, what really happened, but um, it was uh, the filing of that lawsuit was um, uh, uh, like the movement of tectonic plates in the crypto world. And I don't think it was done lightly at the SEC. So my, my guess is that um, uh, they were running out of time. Yeah, they had been, if you read the complaint, they had been entering into um, tolling agreements uh, with the defendants. It looked like for several years, you know, an agreement that extends the statute of limitations. Um, so ordinarily, I think you have to bring a securities lawsuit within, uh, I'm not sure how long the SEC has, but normally it's about three, with three within three years of the conduct. But the defendant um, can, can, can waive that. And it looked like they had been doing that for a while. So this is what really confuses me is because if you think of the crypto world, you think you know, these are very much libertarian, anarcho-capitalist kind of thinking people, and these and they did have friends at court within the Trump administration. I'm thinking Mick Mulvaney when when he was a, a congressman, he was the first political figure on the national uh, scale 
who accepted campaign contributions in crypto. So how does the outgoing Trump administration want to get in this dig on, on crypto while the incoming Biden administration, which you, you think is uh, going to be uh, much more uh, uh, emphatic of, about the, the, uh, the privileges of a sovereign state, uh, you know, and, and I actually I want to direct this to, to, to Nick, Joe, but, but uh, how, how do you, how do you um, and, but, but, but uh, Biden nominates a guy who is a known um, crypto proponent uh, to, uh, to, to replace Jay Clayton. I'm totally confused. Uh, Joe, I'll give you a chance to, to, uh, to chime in here, but first, Nick, um, your, your wisdom, please. So I, I think part of it is, you know, the, these cases are created by the staff. The, the commissioners, you know, vote on them, but the, the staff, um, you know, there's a lot less turnover there. They don't necessarily leave with the administration. Although I guess in this case, it is worth pointing out that um, the enforcement division director, Stephanie Avakian, did actually step down at the end of 2020, I believe. Um, but for the most part, I, you know, the staff just kind of, you know, they keep trucking along, they do their thing. So I don't necessarily know that, um, you know, the, the outgoing administration was a huge factor in that, except for, as Joe said, you know, just making sure they had the majority of the commissioner votes to bring the lawsuit forward. Um, and then kind of on the, uh, the flip side of that, while it is true that Gary Gensler is a, you know, very outspoken blockchain and crypto proponent, um, he actually has weighed in on XRP while he was a uh, lecturer at MIT. And um, I'm just pulling up the notes here, but he said that in his view, he thinks XRP is a non-compliant security. So I don't necessarily know that him being, uh, you know, confirmed as the head of the SEC will necessarily be a good thing for Ripple in this case. Uh, he seems to have, you know, stated pretty plainly that he's, con you know, he doesn't think they followed the law in that. Um, yeah. Just as far as that one goes. Right. And, you know, I, uh, Nick, I, I had a, actually had a question for you that, that um, it, it seems to me, I was just comparing biographies, but uh, Gary Gensler appears to have been at the MIT um, uh, digital currency uh, initiative about the same time as your boss, Mike Casey. Did they know each other from there? I believe they did. Yeah. Uh, okay. Great. Well, say hi to Mike for me. <laughs> um, but uh, but anyway, uh, so let me just throw this back to uh, to Joe, who I think uh, had some some thoughts on this topic as well. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think um, I don't think crypto regulation. Um, necessarily breaks down along party lines. Um, uh, and I also don't think that the, the, you know, Mick Mulvaney might have accepted donations in, in crypto, but I, I don't think that, you, I, don't, I wouldn't characterize the Trump administration as being crypto friendly in any sense. Um, and the certainly the posture of the SEC under Clayton was an enforcement driven posture by and large and not a regulatory um, posture um uh and you know i think that's one of the, the the big problems with the xrp lawsuit um uh and you know even the way that um you know the sec is now characterizing the case in front of the judge um i think there was a hearing on monday where the the sec lawyer said something to the effect of you know we just want it registered we just want them to, to comply with the registration requirements and what he left out is that um, and, and people ask this question all the time, um, and I get clients all the time, or I used to, when, when, <laughs> when people used to come to us asking me to represent them on an ICO, and they'd say, we want to comply with the securities laws. You know, we want to um, just tell us how to comply with the securities laws. And, um, and I, I, you have to kind of explain to folks, but you know, once, once something's a security, um, we can, I can draft a registration statement, I can draft a prospectus for it, but once it's a security, it can't be used. Um, because blockchain tokens, by definition, need to move around from wallet to wallet, person to person on a blockchain. Um, and in the case of XRP, you know, they have to move from, uh, you know, from a sending bank to a receiving bank over a blockchain. But once something's a security, it can't move that way. 
um, the entire um, so the, the entire securities regulatory apparatus in this country um, uh, is is pervasive and all encompassing. It applies to everybody who who, who deals in securities um, as a business. And you know, for example, if, if something's a security, that means it can't trade on Coinbase. Um, you know, can't it can't it can't so a digital asset that's a security suddenly it can't be trading on Coinbase alongside um, Bitcoin and Ether. Um, it has to trade on a national securities exchange like the, S, uh, the NYSE or NASDAQ. And today there is no national securities exchange where you can trade a digital asset. And it has to move from, from it, it only, you know, basically if you're, if you're gonna be, if you're gonna be in the business of sort of touching these things on a customer basis, you've gotta be registered as a broker dealer. Um, so it's, to me, it's just, it's, it's vastly simplifying things and say, oh, look, all we want them to do is register it give disclosure, because once you do that, you've got an asset that's effectively not usable anymore. Okay, I want to um, actually circle back and talk a, a, about um, Coinbase and other centralized exchanges and whether they could fill this, uh, this need. But first of all, um, and I'm throwing this out, uh, this, uh, out to both of you. Um, can we just talk about, because I we might've lost like half our audience already. Can we talk about what the lawsuit um, is and uh, what the stakes are, and um, and and who's answerable, and uh, what is going to be determined based on this lawsuit. Sure. Um, I guess I can start there. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically, at its core, the lawsuits, you know, the SEC is saying. Ripple uh, CEO Brad Garlinghouse and chairman, and I believe former CEO Chris Larson, uh, sold XRP and unregistered securities transactions um, over the course of at least seven years, and it's ongoing. And they're alleging that they raised 1.3 billion, 1.4 billion uh, during that period. Um, so, you know, the the implications are is uh, if XRP is deemed a security if Ripple loses this suit. Yeah, that's going to be a pretty serious, uh, it'll probably be a serious issue for a lot of the folks who currently hold XRP. As Joe said, they, you know, they won't be able to transfer it or sell it. Um, even right now, you have a lot of retail investors who bought it off of exchanges um, and who are holding it or, you know, expecting its price to go up or at least, you know, they're expecting to be able to offload it. Who currently can't because the exchanges they were holding it on have delisted or suspended the, you know, the cryptocurrency. Um, so there's a, a retail impact there. Um, XRP is also currently used by you know banks. It's used by Ripple. Um, I guess there's a, an open question of whether or not it will still be usable for its remittance, uh, you know, use case that Ripple's been marketing for a couple of years. Uh, it, it if, also it also bears mentioning, Nick, um, if you don't mind my interjecting, that uh, that XRP is used by some real solid citizens. Um, I mean, just today, MoneyGram uh, said that it could no longer use XRP. But but who are some of the um, the financial institutions that um, are just longstanding, legacy, mature? respectable financial institutions that are using XRP. So I know that, uh, you know, Santander Bank, um, I think PNC Bank, they've all announced pilots using XRP in the past. I'm not sure how many of them have turned those pilot programs into, you know, full-scale production uh, projects, but mm -hmm. yeah, there definitely have been, you know, some, as you say, longstanding legacy financial institutions that have looked at XRP and at least said, you know, hey, we'll test this out for, you know, either international remittances or, you know, as some other uh, use case. Right. And this is like, the, and we're talking about international remittances, you're talking basically um, disrupting SWIFT. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of, one of the use cases has been, you know, just using uh, in for emerging markets, uh, being able to, you know, just transfer funds you know, outside of, as you say, the outside of SWIFT, outside of the legacy, you know, Western Union type uh, financial rails. Okay. All right, uh, Joe, care to pick up the thread there? Sure, I mean, um, you know, the, the, 
just for those who aren't familiar with, I mean, the basic rule in the United States is um, if you're going to offer or sell a security, it, you have to register it with the SEC um, unless there's an exemption. Um, and so if something is a security, um, you, and, and certainly if you're going to offer it to the public, um, uh, then you know, you've got to register with the SEC. So once, 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 once an asset is a security, um, it is very clear in the United States that if you're going to offer or sell in the United States, you have to register it with the SEC. Um, but to, to, for the, the reason why it's now unusable for its purpose and why you, um, you know, why you're going to see things like fair announcements like MoneyGram is, um, you know, my understanding, and Nick can correct me on this, but my understanding is that XRP is effectively a bridge currency. So if I'm, let's say I'm a bank in, um, uh, Bangladesh, and I want to send, um, I want to send cash from Bangladesh into the United States. Then I, I get my local currency in the Bangladeshi market. I convert that into Ripple, um, presumably on an exchange somewhere where I can, um, where I can, uh, you know, purchase Ripple with the the local Bangladeshi currency, and then send that to a bank in the United States. And that bank in the United States has then got to convert that into dollars. But there's now no way for the bank in the United States to do that because the bank would have to, you know, there's no market into which the bank can sell that um, because if it's a security, that means the only, that it, the only place that you're actually really allowed to trade that would be on the National Securities Exchange. Um, and there is no National Securities Exchange that's listed, um, that's listed, that's listed XRP. So if you think in the, the, the normal FX market, um, uh, you know, the Bangladeshi bank would convert their, their currency to dollars and then you know, send dollars or maybe, you know, may, or maybe they would even send the Bangladeshi currency to the U.S. bank and then the U.S. bank would go out of the FX market and convert the, the Bangladeshi currency into U.S. dollars. And that's fine. That's all you have to do. There's an OTC market or, the, you know, a regular interdealer market in converting currencies back and forth from one another. Everybody understands how to do that. Um, but when you throw a, you throw a security into the mix, and it's like you know it's like throwing a firecracker into in, in, into the to, into the mix. It just it does it doesn't work. Um, so um, uh, you know, picking up on something that Nick said, you know, there, there there were a lot of investors who were harmed by this because investors had been able to go out and purchase XRP uh, on on you know on uh, uh, digital asset trading venues. And they've been doing it for many years at this point, um, you know, at least five or six years that XRP has been, been um, through trading publicly in these markets. And so, you know, the minute the SEC's case was announced, um, people who understood what that meant, the position that the SEC was taken, taking, understood that, that the use case that, that, that um, you know, Ripple Labs had been developing for many years you know, was suddenly really called into question. So the value of XRP you know, fell immediately you know, even before uh, the trading venues started um, delisting it. Um, just people could read the tea leaves and see what the SEC was saying about this thing. Okay, so um, before we push on, I'm taking a look at uh, the comments and I'm seeing all anyone cares about is what I'm drinking. And, uh, and uh, Barry Parker, hey Barry, uh, reports that he's, uh, he's having a, a Buffalo Trace on the rocks. And um, I love Buffalo Trace. I've got a bottle of Buffalo Trace uh, not 10 feet away from me right now. Um, I would say though, this is Black History Month. And if you're not drinking Uncle Nearest, if you're drinking bourbon, then you may as well be drinking Budweiser's with the rest of the Proud Boys. But uh, that aside, um, I'm going to, to throw one more question out to the, to the panel. And while I do that, if you have any legit questions about this uh, subject matter, please raise your hand um, in, the, in the Zoom menu here. And I'll ask Britt to, um, uh, to curate um, and uh, just um, you know, uh, open up uh, one channel at a time, you know, open up uh, one mic at a time. Uh, for uh, a couple of questions before we proceed with the rest of the panel. But in the meantime, I, I do want to ask, um, you know, you're, you're, 
there there have been these um, amended, the, the complaint's been amended. There's been a discovery hearing. There's a lot of talk uh, about getting the um, uh, the SEC and the uh, and uh, Ripple Labs to settle. But I'm thinking, is that even possible? I mean, uh, XRP is either a security or it's not, or it's being traded as a security or it's not. Yeah, How actually, there's. I think there is a route to settle it. Um, I believe we, so. Bill Hinman, the former director of the Division of Corporation Finance, which is the SEC division that you know, you know, really sort of weighs in on quest on this question is you know is is that is that orange a security or not? Um, in a speech that he made, um, I think in the 2017 timeframe, he raised the possibility that Ether Ethereum um, had started out as a security but had morphed into um, a non security. And there, you know, I can go into all the sort of technical reasons why that would be, but but he, he did raise that possibility, and it's something that the that the um, you know that the that the community has really seized on. And so, a a way that that the XRP case might have been settled um, would have been to focus in on the conduct in in the in the 2013 timeframe, and um, you know charge. You know, charge Ripple Labs with with violations of the securities laws in the 2013 timeframe, but say nothing at all about the current status of Ripple, uh, under the idea that that um, you know while those initial sales may have been problematic, that the asset itself um, is not a security. Um, but when we saw the complaint that was filed back at the end of December, it very clearly said in, in paragraph eight, um, you know, right up right up front that current sales of the asset, you know, continue to be illegal unregistered securities offerings. So I think, you know, if there, if there were any room for a settlement, and I certainly have no idea about what sort of, um, you know, discussions may have gone on before or what discussions may be going on now, I think the shape of a settlement, you know, might be along the lines of the SEC um, getting their pound of flesh for, you know, the 2013 sales, 2014 sales, but then saying nothing at all about whether uh, current sales um, are, are problematic and also not getting an injunction against current sales. And it strikes me that that, you know, for, from Ripple's perspective, this is existential, I think. You know, if, if, at least to the extent that they want to, you know, do a business that's, that's touching the United States. Um, and, and so, um, you know, I don't know why they would settle a, a case um, uh, with the SEC, um, um, you know, un, un, unless they were able to, you know, live another day. Um, and, you know, you could you can see them being OK with a settlement where the question of its current status is just left unresolved. And the SEC could, you know, could could walk away with, you know, a lot of money. Um, and, and, you know, pat themselves on the back for having, you know, enforced the federal securities laws and gotten a big recovery for investors. Um, but it could have left unadjudicated the status of whether or not today XRP is a security. And I think that, that would have been, um, a settlement that, um, you know, that people would have, um, uh, liked, I mean, it, it obviously splits the baby. Yeah, I don't think the SEC would have settled with a statement that today XRP is not a security, but I'd rather, you know, I don't think you need to push them on that. I think you can leave that and fight it, you know, fight that at a later time. Well, if, uh, if you're uh, going back to uh, the Old Testament and you're, you're uh, citing King Solomon, it should be reported that the baby could not be split. And uh, so... Nick, I was I was if, citing Bertolt Brecht actually, but you can call it. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> when the shot. No. Um. Anyway, uh, Nick, if if you were uh, Brad Garlinghouse, would you settle? So Brad Garlinghouse actually said that they tried to reach a settlement. I believe it was on Twitter. Um, I think right after the case came out. 
and for whatever you know he i don't think he went into specifics um about why they did you know why they couldn't come to an agreement but i do believe they were trying to go for a settlement prior to the case being brought yeah and- i mean look that they, 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 they had so many tolling agreements they were clearly in discussions for a long time right um yeah and they published their well they published i think the wells response um so yeah it's I guess it depends on what the you know SEC is looking for, as Joe said. Um, you know, if there is actually there's a precedent for the SEC there too, because if you remember the Block One settlement back in 2019, I think, um, you know, they said that the original EOS sale was a securities violation, but EOS at the time of the settlement was, I don't remember if they explicitly said it wasn't a securities you know transaction. They left it open. Yeah, they left it. They left alone. They they took the fine from yeah. Block One, and you know everyone continued on their merry way. So, yeah, you know, it, it seems like that would have made sense for Ripple for sure. Um, the SEC, I guess, uh, has you know for whatever reason they didn't want to go for that. Well, and, and to me, that's the that's the mystery of what the SEC did here, um, because if the SEC loses this case on the merits, um, I think they they've. They, they've sunk their regulatory project on 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 crypto assets. Um, you know, they and and I I, I think they, they picked a very um, uh, very sympathetic defendant to go after here. You know, the Ripple Labs was not running, you know, a Silk Road type business. You know, they were not running a they were not running they, and they were not running a frivolous business. Um, if you look at some of the early um, enforcement actions that the SEC brought in the ICO cases, they were frivolous businesses and you just read them and they were, they're silly. Um, you know, they, it just, you know, the munchie token or the, you know, you, you know, just things that clearly people had just sort of dreamed up in order to kind of raise money. Uh, off, 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 off of, off of uh, investors, um, and there was a mania going on. But Ripple Labs has a real business. You know, the the interbank market, the interbank uh, money transfer market, is a huge market, and they came up with a disruptive technology for that market. And the and Ripple Labs itself, um, you know, I can't remember what its latest you know um, private valuation was, but it was a you know it was a big company. It was not some tiny little company somewhere. And, um, and and that's before you even get to the the investors who lost money, um, at, you know, in the wake of the SEC's action. And the judge, you know, I've, I I don't know anything about the judge other than you know what I you know I read her Wikipedia entry. You know, she was a looked like she had been a um, uh, you know a, a New York State judge for many years. Maybe had some background in the criminal law. Anyway, she doesn't look like. Um, uh, you know, somebody like me, um, you know, a, a capital markets lawyer, a corporate lawyer, um, uh, you know, who might be receptive to the arguments the SEC is making. Um, um, you know, the, the SEC brings cases all the time that I, as a securities lawyer, think this is a slam dunk. Well, of course, the SEC is right. And, and sure enough, they get in front of a, a federal court, um, you know, where the judge is not somebody who spends their days obsessing over the, uh, the federal securities code. And they kind of look at it from a more practical perspective and they say, what the hell are you doing? And, and I think there's a big risk to the SEC that that's what's going to happen to them here. Um, that, that a judge is going to see a, a legitimate business that was shut down for all intents and purposes or will be shut down for all intents and purposes after they had been operating for, for many years. Um, uh, you know, again, on the last day of Clayton's uh, tenure, and those are bad facts from the SEC's perspective. And you know what the, the old saying, bad facts make bad law is, is true. And I think the SEC is really at risk of having, of, of having their regulatory authority throttled back here. Um, and uh, I think that's a real risk, uh, Joe, because uh, the, the uh, I mean, once upon a time when, uh, and that is to say as recently as last month, uh, when the SEC brought suit, um, it was almost like a rubber stamp from the bench. Uh, the SEC very rarely loses an enforcement action. Oh no, they they lose a lot actually. They, do. <laughs> they don't lose. They don't lose when they try cases in their own court. You know, in the in the in the administrative law judge court. But they lose. They they lose cases all the time. They lose Reg FD cases. They lose. Um, 
they, 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 they lose um, cases about their authority to regulate, they, they lost the case about their authority to re regulate hedge funds. Um, years ago, they lost their authority, they, they lost a case over their authority to, um, um, uh, uh, to, to, to regulate corporate governance. Um, they lost the complex mineral case. They, I have lost, to they, they lost the case against Mark Cuban. They, they lose all the time when they get in front of a federal okay, judge. Fair, fair enough, fair enough. Um, so uh, uh, now that we've, uh, we've run into the limits of my authority, um, I'm gonna ask um, Brett, uh, Brett, do you have um, any hands raised there? No, I don't see anything, um, but to ask, uh, if anybody wants to ask any questions, send them in through the chat or through the Q&A function. All right. And uh, I would still ask that um, if you do have a, a, a question, fine, uh, fill it in through the, the chat function or whatever. But I would just as soon uh, call on you because if you're a financial writer and you can't ask questions in public, I need to have a long talk with your high school guidance counselor. Uh, um, so we'll ask one more question before, uh, before seeing if anyone's uh, got any questions from Gina at Gallery. And that is why XRP? Uh, what, why are they going after Ripple Labs? Why are they going after this particular uh, coin rather than, um, than BTC, which, um, you know, once upon a time during the, uh, the, the Dow scandal, the, uh, um, that was, uh, uh, that, that definitely harmed U.S. investors. Um, or Ethereum, which uh, uh, again, um, uh, uh, Commissioner Hinman has suggested, well, no, that doesn't look like, an, uh, like a, um, a security to him. So really, why, I don't want to use the term pick on, but why pick on XRP? And uh, Nick, let me, let me throw it to you first. Well, Ripple's been a pretty, you know, they're a fairly prominent company in the space. Um, yeah, I, I can't speak to the SEC's reasoning, but I, I think they saw Ripple as a, you know, um, let me phrase it carefully as a good case to bring in terms of, you know, if they win, it's a pretty, you know, it's pretty major, uh, you know, company. Um, they're affiliated with the third largest crypto asset. Um, it, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of upside in winning this case. And, and as you said, uh, the SEC has kind of, members of the SEC have said or implied that Ether is not a security. After the Dow uh, incident, they did publish that report saying, you know, in their view, uh, Ether looked like, um, sorry, the, the specifics of the Dow case made it look like that was a unregistered securities uh, offering, I believe. And they just, you know, they said that in that instance, they wouldn't bring an enforcement action. Um, if I recall correctly, that was before I got into crypto. So I, this is, I kind of looked at it, you know, from reviewing it later on, but yeah, I think that's how they approached it. Um, and as far as Bitcoin and Ether are concerned now, you know, you have a fairly, if not robust, at least, you know, a very fairly rapidly growing derivatives market around both those crypto uh, assets. You have, you know, Ether futures in the US, you have Bitcoin futures and options. So I think, you know, they probably at this point, um, yeah, I'm sure they, if they saw the need to, they could find some kind of way to go after those, but it would be much more difficult. You also don't have any centralized companies that are really affiliated with either Bitcoin or Ether that you can just point to and say, you know, if we go after this company, you know, that's it for, you know, the ecosystem. And I'm not saying that that's true for XRP. You know, if Ripple dies, it's certainly possible XRP will continue on, but it's, um, you know, it is much more closely tied, but I guess it is worth re also reiterating that you know, XRP is not the name defendant. They they are going after Ripple Labs and two executives there. So, um, you know, it's kind of more a suggestion that XRP is being targeted rather than them explicitly saying like, you know, we're going to shut down this cryptocurrency. 
I think if the question is why did they go after Ripple uh, and not after anybody associated with Bitcoin or Ether, I, I think it's the, the orthodox analysis as to whether or not something is a security, um, you, know, you, have, you have to look at each asset on its own merits. And, 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 and the, the analysis that the SEC uses, I think it's pretty clear uh, under that analysis that neither Ether uh, nor, nor Bitcoin is a security. So I'm not worried about the SEC going after them. If you ask the question, why did they go after Ripple or XRP and none of the, you know, name, you know, a hundred other assets that are out there trading, that is where I, that's where I, what I find head scratching. Because I, I think that there are um, a lot of assets, I'm not going to start naming them. I, I think will. <laughs> Stellar Lumens is developed by the same people who developed XRP. The, the uh, uh, X, w w w what's this XLM? I believe is the the trading symbol for that. Um, why go after XRP and, and not XLM? So I, I, I would just I would just say that um, assets that sort of may may look similar on their you know you know they they may they may look similar in lots of respects. Um, when you when you dig down deep into them, there are actually things that you can hang your hat on uh, under the SEC un, under the under the test. Um, so the, the Howey test. The, the Howey test. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, um, uh, I'm just going to ask you to take one minute and just uh, nutshell the the Howey test. I think most of us know it, but probably not all of us know it. You want me to just state what it is? Like yeah, yeah. Um, uh, under, under the Howey test, a security um, needs to, well, so the federal securities laws have a definition of security that goes on for about uh, a, a paragraph. And one of those items in the, in the, in the description of what, what is a security is something called an investment contract. And I, I think that was something that, you know, may, maybe was, was used um, uh, in, in, in a lot of the, the state blue sky laws that first started being uh, enacted around sort of the turn of the 20th century. But it had no clear defined meaning in the, in the, in the 33 Act, the, the Securities Act of 1933. But in the Howey Court in 1946 gave that term meaning and they said it's, some, it, it's uh, a contract or a scheme or an arrangement that involves an investment of money in a common enterprise um, where, where the investor is led to expect profits based on the efforts of others. So those are either, that's either three or four different elements, depending on how you look at it. But the first is investment of money. The second is common enterprise. The third is reasonable expectation of profits. And the fourth is based on the efforts of others. And under that, each element of that test, whether it's three elements or four elements, has to be satisfied for something to be a security um, or for something to be an investment contract and therefore to be a security under the Howey test. And if you, if you go through each of those four assets or each of those four prongs for Bitcoin or for Ether, um, uh, you can find at least one, maybe more than one element that's not met. Um, I think when you start applying them to XRP, um, given the role of um, Ripple Labs and given um, you know, other attributes of, of XRP, one can make arguments that, that, um, that XRP actually satisfies all four prongs. And, and that's why the, yeah, and therefore is an investment contract and therefore is a security. And that's why, if that's, that, is, that is the argument, um, simple and straightforward, that the SEC is going to be making to the, um, you know, to the, to the court here. Um, the, 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 the lawyers for Ripple Labs, um, to me, they seem to be trying to broaden the, the question out a bit and, 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 and trying to sort of focus the court more on, you know, what is XRP practically? You know, it's really not, it's not like a security, like we normally think of a security. It's actually... It's this thing that has a that, that has a use um, because when you get right down and you start arguing the four prongs of the Howey test, it's difficult, um, and it's difficult for a lot of a lot of digital assets. Right, and and, and that's the thing is I, I could see how uh, Dogecoin or something silly like that 
um, where they, they, they <coughs> developed, um, you know, not in Python and uh, not in XML, but or um, or MQ series. It was developed really in PowerPoint. Uh, what you know. You know, why does that continue to exist? And really the only reason it continues to exist is Elon Musk keeps pumping it. Um, but, uh, but XRP has always been a utility token. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'm starting to see uh, some, some uh, questions come in. And I would just ask Steven Niffelberg mm -hmm. and, uh, and Alex, if, if you care to uh, give us any kind of um, affiliation, uh, if, if you are financial writers, you're with, uh, um, particular outlook, please let us know. But um, we can now take a couple of questions from uh, from the audience. So let's do that. Uh, Stephen Niffelberg uh, asks, what do you think is the strongest argument, if any, that XRP is in fact a security? And if the argument you identify is found to be valid by the court, could other cryptocurrencies be vulnerable to the same argument in being ruled a security? Um, I open it up. Yeah, do you want to take this it's, one over? <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I just, I, I sort of outlined what the, um, you know, what the test is for an investment contract. And I think if you walk through the four prongs of that test, um, you can make an argument that XRP is a security. Um, certainly, if you interpret that test in the expansive way that the staff has interpreted it, um, most prominently in the so-called digital asset framework that they put out in, I think it's 2018, either 2018 or 2019. Um, they, they, they interpreted that test very, very broadly. Um, and if you take, so if you take a broad reading of Howie um, uh, and you do as the staff does and, and ignore the common enterprise element, although, Really, with XRP, you don't have to ignore it. But 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 if you if you read if you read Howie the way the staff does, you can you can tick off you can tick through each of the four steps and say why XRP is a security. And the answer, if 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 the court, you know, whether that's on the district court or on appeal to the Second Circuit, if the court agrees with the SEC's approach on this, then yeah. Um, there are a lot of digital assets that um, are going to be on 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 shaky ground. Right. Again, I don't think I'm Ether sorry, and Bitcoin are, are, are two of those. All right, all right, Nick. Um, I also wanted to, to ask you. Let's say that um, ultimately XRP is found to be a security. What will that? What will the impact be on uh, the cryptocurrency market ge more generally? Um. I think, you know, any other cryptocurrencies where they could have any facts that are similar to XRP um, or any project that, you know, if you can point to them and say, you know, this is a company that's really keeping this crypto afloat. You know, if these guys folded, then that crypto would die. I, I think if, you know, the, uh, the SEC wins this case, those projects would probably have to, you know, probably they should talk to their lawyers, but um I imagine it would be easier for the SEC to use this case as precedent and say, yeah. all right, well, you know, uh, you guys uh, are clearly the only ones who are running, you know, random token here. Uh, therefore, you're a common enterprise. Therefore, you know, you're pumping this, you're marketing this, and we're going to go after you. Um, you know, just a continuation of really the ICO enforcements of 2018, 2019, and just, you know, a lesser degree last year, but just, you know, keep, that'll keep happening, I imagine. All right. And you know, one thing that, um, that, that keeps occurring to me is that perhaps Ripple Labs is just an easy target for the SEC. It is US domiciled. It is, um, you know, clearly affiliated closely uh, with this one, uh, uh, cryptocurrency in particular, even though this cryptocurrency is really more or less a utility token, um, then uh, you know it, it, it makes more sense to go after these guys than anyone who, I, I mean, rather than going after, say, let, let's say that for the sake of argument, 
that they had their sights set on Ethereum, that they hadn't already considered Ethereum to be something other than a security. They couldn't go after um, uh, Vitalik Buterin because he is a Canadian national, but they could go after, um, uh, after uh, Brad and Chris because they're Americans. Is, does that you know, I, I, I have a hard time thinking that an easy target is somebody that can afford to hire you know, Mary Jo White at Deva Boys and, and um, <laughs> the, you know, the Paul Weiss sure. and the Kellogg Huber law firm. And, and I believe Cleary Gottlieb's already in, also involved there. They're not an easy Why are you? They've got, they've got very deep pockets and they're represented by very good counsel. Um, you know, I, I think an easy target would have been any number of, of, of companies that have, you know, uh, you know, you know, some U.S. connection, and and didn't have the kind of deep pockets that that Ripple had, which, again, is why I'm, um, you know, why I was astonished, frankly, that they brought the lawsuit. Um, look, it's a hail mary. If they, if the SEC wins this, then, then, then boy, have they, ex they've, they've, they've gotten a, a you know, a, 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 the judicial imprimatur on on a pretty major expansion of their regulatory power. But if they lose it, and they haven't, they haven't, um, you know, they have, they have not um, developed a long track record of litigated cases. You know, you have the kick case and the telegram case um, and not much more, um, you, you know, that, that, they, that they've managed to, to get district court opinions on. And so they, the, 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 the appellate courts have not weighed in on it yet. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to stop right there because uh, kick and telegram, these are not, uh, cryptocurrencies; these are messenger apps. What What's the connection? I'm I'm asking. Well, in both, it, there there were there was a cryptocurrency in each case that the SEC alleged was. I mean, Telegram is a messenger app, but it had a it it was it had introduced a um, a token, um, and the SEC sued to get that from from being distributed and got a billion dollar you know billion dollar disgorgement out. Okay. All right, so uh, Actually, that, if I could just, sorry, just to add there, just add there, and this is kind of to your other point. Uh, Kick is based out of Canada. Telegram was based out of, I Russia. think, Russia. Um, so just to your point of, you know, whether it's easier to go after a U.S. company versus not U.S. company, I, I don't think that's, you know, a huge consideration for the SEC. They've definitely, you know, sued non-U.S. entities. One broker is another one, um, and, you know, they've, won those cases so i don't think necessarily that that needs to that's like a huge consideration for them as far as these go All right fair enough uh but that also brings up the international uh, uh dimension here and that's that the sec is hardly the only well first of all in our patchwork quilt of uh, regulatory uh entities in the u.s uh the sec isn't even necessarily primary uh, here in the states, and um, but every country's got its own uh, 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 regulatory authorities. And it, let me just ask: Is XRP running afoul of any other regulatory authorities anywhere else in the world? I That's don't thought. think anyone has said that yet. I believe the UK's uh, Financial Conduct Authority has said XRP is not a security. Don't quote me on that. I'm not 100% certain, but mm -hmm. I believe that's where they're leaning. I think in Japan as well, um, you know, their regulators leaning towards XRP is not a security under Japanese law. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think who else has weighed in on, uh, on that, but, you know, I, I think in you know, some of these jurisdictions, they, they've either created like a utility token definition or they've otherwise said that whatever XRP is, it does not satisfy their specific definition of a security. So I want to um, go back to, uh, to our comments here. And Alex has a, a question. If these digital assets are determined to be securities, could the XRP security trade over the counter or in an individual wallet-to-wallet -wallet manner, which could get around the broker-dealer requirements. 
Alternatively, could the SEC provide better guidance allowing broker dealers to handle digital assets uh, securities similar to traditional securities? Well, so yeah, I mean, this is the, the, this is the basic problem. Um, uh, you know, to the first part of that question, you know, if it is a security, could it, can it trade OTC? Well, OTC, of course, is a market that, you know, is a, is a, an intermediated market. You know, the over the counter market is, you know, you go to your broker and you try to, you know, you want to, you want to buy a, a security and, and, and he can't, the broker can't send that order to the exchange. He goes to another broker or maybe he has it in his, in his inventory. Um, and so if, if XRP is a security, then um, the, the only people who would be allowed to sort of engage in that kind of OTC market activity on a customer basis for you would be a, a broker dealer. Um, and, and yes, um, it is, it is you, you can hypothesize a way in which um, if it is a security, it can be you know, transacted um, through that um, broker market, um, um, but if you're if if the if the purpose of XRP is is to facilitate um, interbank transfers, and then suddenly you've got to you've got to add um, you know brokers into that mix. Well, the brokers are going to have to be paid for what they're doing, um, and suddenly this cheap and expensive um, frictionless um, bridge currency that XRP is supposed to be suddenly has this, you know, albatross around its neck called the brokerage commission that it's got to pay. And, 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 you know, you'll, you'll very quickly find that the, that you know, the more people you have holding out their hand, you know, to try to get a cut of the action, suddenly it's, it's no longer a very efficient way to sort of transfer money back and forth. And now then the question, can I, would I be able to transfer it, um, on a wallet to wallet basis? That raises all sorts of other questions. If it's a quote unquote unhosted wallet, you know, that's just something that I set up on my own computer and I downloaded software yeah. and I, and I just, you know, I'm running it on my own computer. There's probably a way to do that uh, on a totally peer to peer basis. Um, and, 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 and do that without triggering any sort of regulated activity. The problem is you're going to have FinCEN come in and say, we don't like unhosted wallets because you can people use those. To... Okay, just re real, real quick, this is the first time we're referencing FinCEN. Ben, FinCEN is, is, a, a, is a, a, an organ of the, um, of the Fed and it's called uh, the Financial, uh, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. They, 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 they're, they're into um, money laundering and, and um, combating the finance and terrorism and that sort of thing. And they're very concerned about so-called unhosted wallets. They're very concerned about people, um, you know, opening up a wallet on their own iPad or their phone and being able to transfer value, you know, to other people who have just sort of downloaded software because it's taking that flow of cash outside of the oversight of the, um, uh, of, of the federal banking authorities and can be used for, you know, for bad things, you know, whether that's, you know, the purchase of illicit goods and services or the financing of terrorism, for example. Right. And, and actually, I, I believe that there's a, a congressional hearing coming up about using, uh, about crypto as yeah. a tool for terrorist financing. And, yeah. And, and, that, uh, and, and, that, and, that, and that all has to go with, you know, how, how is it it's, it's not that crypto itself is like inherently a bad thing. It's just an asset. The question is, how is it, how is it transferred from one person to another? And, you know, ever since 9-11, um, you know, we've, we've, we've put you know, billions of dollars, trillions of dollars of resources into making sure that we understand, um, you know, how cash is or how, how money and value are flowing around the world. And, mm -hmm. The fear on the part of the regulators is that they that that that, that crypto, um, you know, is a, a bit of a black box to them. Right, and and, and AG designate uh, Garland is probably going to be more concerned with one six than nine eleven. Um, it's I, I I think we're going to oh, that one six had to be financed too. Yeah, that's right. Um, 
So anyway, uh, we are at the end of our time. And guys, I, I got to say, this really flew by for me. Um, so let me just uh, first uh, to you, Nick, uh, any closing thoughts? Um, no, I think this is going to be an interesting case to follow, I think. Um, you know, especially as the Division of Enforcement gets a new permanent uh, director and as Gary Gensler gets confirmed, I believe his hearing is on the 2nd of March, so next Tuesday. Um, I imagine we're going to start seeing, you know, more around this. And I don't know if we're going to see guidance around crypto assets, but I, I think with the new administration, we are going to see at least more, you know, stuff being said around crypto assets. So, um, you know, how that relates to the XRP case and the Ripple case and how that, uh, you know, evolves, uh, I think it's going to be, let's say interesting. I think it'll be an interesting time. I think we're going to, you know, probably learn a lot in the coming months. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, Joe, your thoughts? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I can't wait to hear Gensler's testimony. Um, I think it's going to tell us a lot in terms of what his what his plans are, and I and I hope I, I hope that the SEC will take the sec the second the second step and stop treating this as strictly an enforcement priority, and instead take the second step and 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 treat it as a regulatory priority. I mean, it may crypto may well be a security, and and I I'm 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 in some respects I'm kind of over that argument. Let's just say yeah, it's a security. Let's then figure out how it ought to be regulated. And to me, that's the much more interesting question. And I'm hoping that with, with Gensler's um, expertise and, and knowledge in this area, that that's a, that's a task that he will tackle. He's probably a whole lot more uh, plugged in to, uh, to crypto than, than Joe Kennedy was. So anyway, uh, gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for, for your time. Uh, Joseph Paul, Nicholas Day. Um, and uh, gentlemen, uh, just on behalf of the entire New York Financial Writers Association, I want to thank you so much for your time this evening and your insights. Um, it's been most illuminating.